Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going well. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in, hit that subscribe button across all platforms. Follow me on Twitter at Focus Compound. Uh, and be sure to sign up at quickfs.net. Uh, in today's Snap Judgments podcast, we are going to use QuickFS. So if you want to get access to that, go to quickfs.net. And when you sign up, tell them that you came from Focus Compounding. So I was actually just, we were laughing a little bit because... Um, Jeff, as I pulled up QuickFS, he's sitting next to me, and obviously mm -hmm. I have my computer screen right here. Right. And it's kind of just a weird angle. And he's like, yeah, I, sometimes I have a hard time seeing the numbers. And it was funny because one time we did a podcast, and I don't even know if we said it or not, but Jeff, uh, he didn't have his glasses on, and he didn't have contacts. <laughs> so he was like, just read me the numbers out loud. And I remember mm -hmm. I was just reading them out loud, and he was just doing it all off uh, all from his head. So I thought that was funny. But um, and it's it's weird, too, for me, like because this mic stand gets in the way. So sometimes I read like with my right eye only mm -hmm. and this other big mics in my left eye. So but you know what we do? We, we keep on moving forward and producing content for the people. And, and if you watch this on YouTube, you get to see uh the quick fs thing on the screen exactly that's we the best can't part. see that way i know so you have an advantage over us absolutely so uh let's go so uh quick fs uh is what we use like i said this is a snap judgment podcast um every we'll do you know once we run out of stocks i'll do another call for stocks but if you want to ask uh us to go over a stock instead of dming them to me because a lot of people they like to dm me them or they'll send me emails okay. just go to this uh, tweet from August 31st and reply to it. And as soon as we go through all these stocks, I will do another call for stocks and we'll just start this process all over again. Uh, but people really like to be able to see you just basically break down a company and give your opinion on it. Of course, we don't know the story so in depth. We're looking at it with a, you know, from a, a high bird's eye view, um, but it is a lot of fun. So we're going to go and pick and the first company will be CTO. CTO Realty Growth Inc. Market cap 316 million. Enterprise value 521 million. Uh, what is this? Uh, you, you do let's the... see. Is a Florida-based publicly traded real estate company which owns income properties comprised of approximately 2.4 million square feet in diversified markets in the United States and approximately 23.5 interest in Alpine Income Property Trust Inc., a publicly traded net lease real estate investment trust. Which is publicly traded. It is publicly traded. Okay. Sometimes when you find these situations, it kind of reminds me of Munger's Close and Fund. You know, trade. Sometimes you can there's get a quite discount, a stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, there's quite a few that you can buy with a discount in something else. And some mm -hmm. of them are pretty complicated. I don't want to... Um, they, there's a lot of them. Or not a lot of them, but there's some that I've followed and that always trade at discounts to the pieces that mm -hmm. you can put them together for you. Um, valuation ratios. I mean, I don't... I mean, current price to earnings, four times earnings... Um, uh, EBIT sales 8.8 .8 times, 10 year median margins on EBIT 23.9 times, um, EBIT free cash flow seven times. We have a 10 year CAGR of 16.5% from 13 million in 2011 to 56 million in 2020. Now, you kind of think about these numbers, I think, a little bit differently when it's, you know, like a real estate play, um, but assets have grown 14% 10 year CAGR. Yeah. So we could go to the cash flow statement. Have you ever purchased uh, a company like this or just that's tied to real estate? Uh, sort of, but not for income generating purposes and stuff, just because things were, were going to happen with mm -hmm. it. So, yeah, I've bought them in special situations when they were going to um, break up or, or liquidate or something like that. Yeah. So look at the, the difference between cash flow to net income the past couple of years. Yeah, that's typical of real estate things. Um so they sold some stuff off, if I'm reading that right. Um, because if you look, they actually generated cash from PPE. and e um, mm -hmm. It's a positive number shown in quick FS instead of a negative number. So they sold off stuff. Um, I don't know. If we look, the cash flow from operations, right, is very unstable. Mm -hmm. So it, you would just look for what's cash flow from operations, and, and you probably put a multiple on that or something. That's where I would start with. I certainly, you know, you'd start with balance sheet or whatever, but then you'd go to cash flow statement and income statement, the least important. And that's true for most any business I'd look at. And certainly for a real estate business, it might be that, you know, reported earnings are meaningless. Um, so, but, you know, if we take like the last 12 months, it was 26 million. Um, last three years on average, 
um not far different from that mm-hmm. so it, it was almost 60 million in 2017 but yeah maybe it's 25 million maybe it's 30 million in that neighborhood of the average of the last few years so what does that multiple look like compared to the stock price if we go to the uh overview we could see what it says and um if you go up a little we can see the market cap and the enterprise value um, market cap 316 million enterprise value 521 million yeah um so so the you know, average 25 like 12 million. times and the uh and the ev is quite a bit more than that um yeah i mean it, it might it might be fine that doesn't seem like a crazy price for it, but we don't know anything about the business mm-hmm. i mean the description gives us nothing mm-hmm. so I would have to know what it is, but it it's not crazy. Um, they have information on the price to book and all that. I don't know what books like though. So if you can see the thing that stands out, right, is that price to book is less than one. Yeah, that's very unusual to see um, real estate things where price to book is less than one right now. So I don't know what that means. Um, you know, it seemed cheap on that basis, but the earning stuff shouldn't matter. Like that doesn't make. A, I would look at it on a cash flow basis normally. So uh, that's how, I, you know, I worry about doing the math on that. Would you but factor in like cap rates or how would you think about that? I try to value each part of it probably. Um, I find them very hard to evaluate for that reason that you don't, you know, like um, what are they going to do when with the cash flows that they mm-hmm. have and all of that. It would be fine if you just know that it's going to be this amount of cash flow and that's going to be paid out. Um, but as you can see there, look at the asset growth and everything. Yeah. So that's when we talk about reinvestment stuff. You know, the same thing I say when I say, like, if someone said, like, should you buy this gold miner? If they would only produce the gold and sell it and pay you it all in dividends, that's one thing. But real estate things often want to grow. And like you saw there, their growth in assets is really big. So you're reinvesting it into it. Mm -hmm. So um, do we have information on what the dividend is and stuff like that? Let's see. We could see if they pay. Yeah, I guess cash will say we'll give it to us, too. Cash paid for dividends. So... 2020, 14 million went out. The last 12 past months 20, was 24 million. Yeah, so, uh, we have no idea is the answer. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's been nothing, sometimes it's been a lot. So, let's see if there's. Give it a quick. Uh, so, no, nothing you find dividend yield really it, quick. That, there's no way to do it without like looking at where the properties are and all of that. Mm-hmm. So, but it seems like it's in a range that's not that weird uh, multiples that we just said. So, got it. Um, let's see. D-F-I-N. You ever heard of this company? Yes. D-F-I-N operates as a risk and compliance solutions company worldwide. The company operates through four segments, capital markets, software solutions, capital markets, compliance, and communications management. Uh, Looks like a bunch of other stuff. Uh, This uh, gentleman, Richard Sosa, is a huge fan of this company. He actually, every time somebody does anything or asks for any sort of stock, he always recommends this one. Recommends DFIN. Okay, so how was this formed? Because I assume that this was broken up from RR Donnelly and Donnelly Financial. It, it was something like that. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does it give us information on that when it was and everything? No. Mm, no, not from QuickFS. Okay, so um, they should give us a description a little bit above. The part that, um, let's see. Okay. So, are they trying to, let's see. Let's look at just the financial information and get an idea here. I think this is going to be hard to tell. Yeah. Um, so, we have declining revenue lately. See, what I was curious about with this is if I think this the business is, shifted. But I could be well, wrong. Well, if on this that. is shifting from being distributing print stuff, correct, to, to doing digital, exactly. Things. Yeah. I was gonna. I think it's more of like a software, like software as a service play in a way. Nowadays, like they've switched from print to digital. Right, but as yeah. you see, gross margin up, operating margin down, mm-hmm. um, or flat, or whatever you want to call it. So that suggests doing that that they're shifting um, that way. Because uh, see, what you have before, you have much lower gross margin. And yet you have pretty good operating profit in some of those years. Yeah. And so that's probably the older business and then something shifted with it. So it's not just there's declines in revenue um, over time, but it's um, something else going on there. 
like we said, a change in the nature of the revenue. You know, I, I like to look at gross profit and see gross profit going up each year. Obviously, the trends in gross profit are not good here. Um, so, you know, that that's something that I would avoid, something with those sorts of trends in gross profit usually. Um, so in a situation like this, if they've shifted their business, how would you think about it? We just can't make a snap judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have to do by learning about the company. Mm -hmm. um, but if if you see, you know, um, like for instance, well, for the most part, revenue is flat to down. But what was concerning me more is the gross profit. You know, you have no positive trend there at all. Um, I don't even mean like in terms of a margin. I just mean the actual amount of gross profit. And so... That would be my concern. I mean, how do you know about the earning power and all of that? Uh, we can look at cash flow because there might be things if they're changing mm -hmm. the business quite a bit that are misleading in terms of earnings. So, you know, that's all over the place. Um, on average, we're talking about uh, probably 80 million, something like that, the last three years average. But then this most recent depending on when the finance, we don't know when the fiscal year ends and stuff. So maybe I should bump that up. So, you know, you could convince me that it's a hundred million or more. Um, that's hard to say because look, it's so much higher now. How much the um, like cash flow from figure. operations was. Yeah, but it has other. So we don't know what that means just by looking at it. Mm -hmm. But so it would, if you look at this past year, it would tell you that they're generally like 140 million or something in free cash flow. But if you look at some of the other past years recently, you'd say that number is way lower. Like, you know, I mean, it could be, 50 million or something. So if we go back to the overview, um, yeah, if we look at the market cap and enterprise value, 1.1 billion market cap, $1.3 billion enterprise value. Yeah. I, you just have to learn about this business. Yeah. I, I don't see anything Too from, to do a from snap judgment. I'll be able to judge it. Yeah. Got it. Let's see. Amazon. We've talked a little bit about Amazon on this podcast. Uh, was that one point uh, six billion? No, it's one point uh, seven trillion. 1. 7 trillion. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Current price to earnings. Yes, Amazon does have earnings. Does generate earnings uh, fifty eight times. Ten year median returns. We could go actually ten year CAGR on revenue. 27.4%, 10-year CAGR on free cash flow, 28.6%, EV to free cash flow, 136 times, um, uh, price to sales, or we could use enterprise value to sales, 3.7 times, 10-year median margins on EBIT, 2.6 times, but revenue has gone from $48 billion in 2011 to $386 billion in 2020. Pretty crazy. Yeah, so it's trading at about, what, um, 17 times gross profit, something like that. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. That's they have, do under a hundred billion in gross profit. Yep. You know, that's high. Um, I don't know how much of that is AWS and all that. Um, and what the economics of that business are. I can't evaluate certainly from a like retail perspective. I'm less positive on it now than a few years ago or whatever, just cause you know, it's the industry's matured so much and the competition is so much and everything. So, you know, that part, it's hard to generate a lot more profitability from that. Um, it, what, what does it have? Half the market online? Um, so they came in, then they're going to kill all brick and mortar. And then from a crazy turn of events, what if they opened up a bunch of retail op operations? What if they opened up a bunch yeah. of retail operations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they're getting into a lot of Whole logistics Foods stuff. And they're starting to do it, yeah. Yeah. How so. that? I mean, when you have a lot of scale, trying to make more less variable expense and higher operating expenses is a usual tactic. So investing in your own fleet of delivery things and all that. Um, yeah. It hasn't gone well for me as an Amazon customer. I have a huge drop off in how much I order from Amazon. Why is that? Because they shifted to doing a lot of their own delivery. So it's not successfully delivered. There's all sorts of problems, returns. You know, they're not UPS and FedEx. Um, so as for me as a customer, they've lost a lot of money, but for the average person, I'm sure it's continuing to go up. I just find it hard. Are you to one of those that guys that orders like everything on Amazon or did order like everything on Amazon? I spent over a thousand dollars on books every single year till this year. 
Um, still spend a lot on Kindle. So their digital stuff Kindle's does sell easy. a lot to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, physical goods from Amazon will be a lot less for me in the future uh, compared to, and, and mostly it's just competition from other things. You know, the pricing and availability and fast shipping from other things is often equal. So I don't know. I, I think, you know, we'll see. It's a very high price to pay, mm-hmm. you know, that's the problem. So, you know, gross margins are what they are. Um, I don't know how, you know, how fast it can grow. It's hard. It's really hard to grow into that kind of multiple to gross profit. I mean, sales is one thing, uh, you know, I mean, reported earnings is one thing, but gross profit is, is tougher. Um, I don't know. It's the same thing I say about Tesla. Now Tesla is a lot more expensive by gross profit than Amazon. Mm -hmm. But the thing that bother that worries me about it is even with very high growth rates, you can try to do the math. I don't see how you get there, you know, I mean, the gross profit margin is still 25% or something, mm-hmm. 20 you know. It's very hard um, to overcome that. So, you know, let's let's say they double that every, I mean, where are they at now? They're, um, if they're growing, you know, well, they grew faster, 20, 40% last year with COVID. Huge year for them. Yeah. If you double every few years, uh, I was going to say every three years or something. Um, how long does it take you to grow into that? Does it really work? Uh, it's just a very high multiple. I mean, you kind of are already counting on, I don't know. Uh, you're valuing it in a steady state of something that's probably closer to eight times this in terms of what it should be doing in gross profit, you know, um, like a traditional retailer. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can compare it to other traditional retailers, like type in Kroger or something or Costco or one of those, you get some ideas. So what's their market cap enterprise value? Kroger's market cap three hundred billion, enterprise value thirty nine billion. So wait, no, their market cap is thirty billion? E yeah, correct, yep. And how much is their gross profit? Thirty thirty point nine billion. <laughs> and yeah. what are their gross margins are like the same as Amazon? Yeah. hmm You know, you could try Costco, you could try Walmart, you, you know. But Amazon has this huge business that is not retail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so what's the market right. cap here on Costco? So Costco, two hundred three billion enterprise value, one hundred ninety nine billion, and gr- gross profit here. So they're trading at a large multiple of gross profit, yeah. as you can see, mm-hmm. because they generate very low uh, gross margin and a much higher operating margin. They're also just valued very high, uh, Costco. So yeah, twenty five times EBITDA. Yeah, but for people listening, in twenty nineteen gross profit was. It's basically $20 billion on average from yeah. 2019, 20. But, I mean, 20. we did Dollar General before. We could see them, so you get an idea. Um, Market cap, $51.7 billion. Enterprise value, right, $55.5 five five that, billion. That's more normal, I'd say, yeah. Um, and better, you know, and, and their, their gross margins are higher. Their operating margins, you know, are obviously better than Amazon's. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I don't know. You know, in the long run, can Amazon grow faster than Dollar General? Maybe. I mean, it is now. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it could, but it has to grow a lot faster. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just it seems like a really, really high price for Amazon for at this size. You know, a Galaxy Digital Holdings. We've looked at this company before, right? Have we? Oh uh, no, just kidding. I was thinking this is the gambling company, or is involved in gambling. Galaxy Digital Holdings, an asset management firm, operates in the digital asset, cryptocurrency, and blockchain technology industry. It operates in five business lines, which include trading, asset management, principal investments, investment banking, and mining. What are your views on mining? What if they say that they're not going to mine anymore? Same thing as a gold miner, Jeff? Crypto uh, they're miner? they're not going to mine anymore, uh, well, uh, there's a limited amount. There right, is. Of, That's of, the uh, pitch. Bitcoin. That is the pitch. Mm-hmm. Um, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, we just looking at it, we won't be able to do anything really. I mean, I mean, there's my, no revenue. My main thought is, this. why is it trading in Canada and it's a New York, New York company? So that would be probably a pass for me on that basis. Okay. But, I mean, I just would say, as a rule, if you're a, a company headquartered in the U.S. trading in Canada, normally that's not a good sign. There could be reasons why you're doing it. I don't know, but I've never found it to be good. <laughs> um, and I'm sure I'm, we must be able to come up with some company that does it. Um, I don't know, though. Yeah. I can't think of one. I'm sure someone can 
think you're going to tell me about a good Ameri- company that's U.S. in of every course. way but listed in Canada. We could stay on the financial theme. Riley, B. Riley Financial Inc. They own some of the Babcock and Wilcox, the part that... Um, okay. The, I think so. I don't know if they, they kept it and stuff, but they did a financing with it, yeah. Interesting. Uh, EBITDA sales, 2.5 times. 10-year median margins on EBIT, 12.8 times. So for people that aren't familiar, uh, it says, through subsidiaries, provides collaborative financial services and solutions in North America, Australia, and Europe. The capital markets segment offers a range of investment banking, corporate finance, consulting, financial advisory, research, securities, lending, wealth management, and sales and trading services to corporate, institutional, and high net worth clients. Basically, they do it all in the investment space. I've always thought of them as like a micro cap investment bank, an um, investment bank for micro caps. Really? Yeah. Okay. Market cap 1.5 billion, enterprise value 3.8 billion. We have a 10 year CAGR of revenue of 35.9%, going from 64 million in 2011 to 903 million in 2020. Also, a 10 year CAGR on assets of 43.4%. Yeah. I, so what's I, going no on there? Way to evaluate mm-hmm. for them. Yeah. Pretty tough from a high level overview. Have you ever looked at this company? Um, I've never looked at their stock and stuff. Like I said, I've looked at many things where they've been part of the deals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see. AMC. Someone says this is a joke, but why, why don't we talk a little bit about AMC? Because we've talked about movie theaters recently, you and me. Yeah. Cinemark, Marcus, AMC. Mm-hmm. AMC's got a $20.6 billion market cap. Let's see what that stock chart looks like. They've raised a lot of capital, took advantage of that whole craze. Mm-hmm. So year to date, the stock is up 1,808%. Mm-hmm. Because they were... You know, they had credit issues. They, they did. Mm-hmm. You know, they came into the COVID and everything. Well, they were basically, they're going to go under whether there was COVID or wasn't. Uh-huh. And uh, then that happened, obviously, uh, unlike the other ones. Any thoughts on AMC or just movie theaters in general? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, my, my feeling on AMC last I looked at them was that they're going to have trouble I- investing uh, on CapEx, you know, at a level to compete with Cinemark and, and all of those. And so I wondered if that would be good for the others in the industry. But, you know, who knows? If they raise enough capital, they won't have that problem. But I, just looking at them before, I figured that a lot of it would go to um, paying debt and stuff like mm-hmm. that and, and not a lot into new CapEx. But that might not be true. Um, it's a perfectly good circuit. Um, they, you know, they... Uh, are comparable in a lot of ways to Cinemark. Uh, some of their locations, not so much, but a lot of things like they've over time they own a bunch of things that are, are more comparable to Cinemark than what they originally had, which was more like um, older urban stuff. So, you know, like in this part of the country, they're the same. You know, they're in the same sorts of locations mm-hmm. and things like that. Less true in other parts of the country. They're more exposed to some parts of the country. They're probably not as good. Uh, Cinemark is a little bit more in parts that are. Um, more attractive for for movie theaters, I think, but more open to competition. It's easier to have competing locations. I don't think there'll be much of a problem, though. I don't think there's going to be people wanting to open movie theaters. So, let's see. E N R. No ticker. Do quick of us. Nope. Oh, this Energize is holding oh. spinoffs too. Okay. Yeah. Energizer, yeah, battery company. Let's right. see. It's a and they had split off. Uh, what was the other? Let's see if they describe what they split off. So I can mention. When that. did they do the spinoff? A few years ago. Well, Energizer was itself a spinoff. Um, and then do they mention anything about where they spun off the um, what are they might call it personal care products or a consumer? What do they call it? No. And All right. Try Edgewell. Try googling. Try putting in quick FS Edgewell. See if that shows up. Personal yeah. care company? Maybe that'll describe it for us for the spinoff. Does it describe what it is? Uh, manufactures and markets personal care products in the wet shave, sun, and skin care. The one where it says, formerly known as Energizer Holdings, changed its name to Edgewell in 2015. Oh, okay. So that was the spinoff. So they spun it off, and they officially kept the name 
uh, I mean, Energizer Holdings, the name Energizer went with the spinoff officially. And then you have this company um, that has the other part of Energizer. Energizer itself was a spinoff from what, Roust and Perino? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think so. Like, uh, you know, over a decade before the second spinoff. Current market cap is 2.5 or 2.6 billion, enterprise value 5.7 billion. Um, EV to sales 1.9 times. 10 year median margins on EBIT 14.6 times. Um, let's see, gross margins have uh, been uh, kind of all over the place. It looks like a low of was last year of 39.4. And then at one point, 2017 to 2018, uh, some years they hit 46% gross margins. Um, operating margin dropped a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kind of all over the place, though, on, on here. But I don't know how much of this data is. Yeah, if we go to the cash flow numbers, we could see that. So um, those should be more stable, probably. Yeah. So that gives us some idea. Uh, but I want to see the description of what is in here. That this is just battery. Um, uh, distributes household batteries, specialty batteries, and lighting products worldwide. Yeah. So you got to worry about that. Um, worry about what? But that's all that they're, that they're in. Okay, so you like know, a pure so, play, battery play. Yeah, I mean Berkshire took Duracell uh, from uh, PNG, right? So they they own it completely, and that was what they took as part of their investment in that company. The two are similar that way. In fact, they were really the same because they they um, they also wanted to get rid of it, and then Berkshire took it. So just like this company wanted to split it off. So we we're talking about spinoffs and whether this is the less um, appealing part of the uh, the side of the business is the battery side. Um, you can see it's leveraged. It's pretty reasonably priced on a free cash flow basis on market cap, but less so on enterprise value. Mm-hmm. So um, they show the EVD, but uh, there's 11 or something, but on the free cash flow basis, it's a lot more attractive. Mm-hmm. That is, if we go to last year, we could see Something's wrong with the, uh, we go to cash flow statement, something's wrong with the cash flow information. Yeah, so I don't know where that's getting that from, but it looks more like it's like eight times uh, their most recent one. And if we look a few years back, it's more like, um, mm, yeah, eight to 15 times. Free so cash in flow. that example though, right? So you're not looking at EV to free cash flow, you're using market cap to free cash flow. Right. Well, how should you? Why are you using market cap? Is that the I don't way know that you that think a, about? No, or? I don't know. That's a good idea. Yeah, so you're just talking out loud. Got it. Um, no, I mean, I, it's cheap on a free on a free cash flow basis. To market cap. Yes. Yeah. Which is what they're turning that you actually get. Sure. You yeah. buy in the stock, yeah. Right. So if they pay you dividends, if they buy back the stock, those sorts of things. Um, if they make acquisitions, that's what matters. And that's a history of how the company created value and stuff in the past was that way through having um, debt and buying other things. If we look at the balance sheet, we could see more information about EV to EBITDA and all of that uh, information about the liabilities and what they are. Yeah. So a lot of long-term debt that you have there. So most of the capital structure is debt in the sense that the enter, the market cap that you're getting is valued. The, the, the market is valuing the uh, equity at less than the face value of the debt, right? So it's about 60% debt or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. It looks like, I don't know exactly because we don't know where the debt trades and everything, but it, it basically looks like a uh, LBO structure. But that's a lot of what it did before. I mean, the combined company before mm-hmm. the split off of Edgewell and, and Energizer and all of that. And even its predecessor, that's what it came off of. And it created a lot of value. So um, it, EV to sales is two times. Price to sales is one time. So that gives you an idea of how leveraged it is. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that it's twice as much. Obviously, EV to sales of two seems somewhat reasonable given where the margins are now. Price to sales of one seems really cheap because you're using a lot of debt. So you have maybe a reasonably priced business if it does okay in the future and a um, and it's cheap if you consider the leverage. In other words, it's cheap if you figure, oh, well, the debt investors aren't going to get a return. I'm going to get all my return because they're settling for a really low return. Um, these things like to acquire a lot of stuff. What's their recent results in revenue and stuff? 
revenue in 2020 was 2.7 billion 2019 was 2.4 billion 2018 was 2.7 billion and actually when we're looking at the cash flow statement yeah. i think it was 2019 i saw or 2000 yeah 19 they bought something for 2.4 billion yeah the acquisition cash went out yeah and half of it issued debt. debt yeah and some of it was stock and some of it was preferred stock mm-hmm. um so you know it, it keeps getting bigger that way. You generally stay away from companies that are quite levered like this, LBO in the public markets, or do you have any thoughts towards that? Uh, I mean, I would worry about things that have the same or shrinking uh, interest in their products and stuff. So I would certainly worry about both Energizer and Edgewell. Um, you know, the what had been Jarden, and or I guess do they call it Jarden now again? Anyway, Newell Rubber made in, in, in Jardin and stuff. Um, same sort of strategy. Uh, yeah. A, a lot of these, I think, don't really grow organically much and like to use a lot of debt and all that in recent years. And so, obviously, I'd be worried about that going forward. And if you get a really cheap price, it's okay. Um, you know, I, I thought Energizer was 10 years ago or something. The way the company looked was was attractive, yeah. And had plenty of debt then. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about a stock that we've talked about on this podcast before, Arc Restaurants. Somebody asked for a snap judgment on that. Um, uh, Arc Restaurants Corp, through its subsidiaries, owns and operates restaurants and bars in the United States. As of October 3rd, 2020, it owned and operated and or operated 20 restaurants and bars, including five facilities located in New York City, two in Washington, D.C., five in Las Vegas, Nevada, three in Atlantic City, New Jersey, three on the East Coast of Florida, and two on the Gulf Coast of Alabama as well as had 17 fast food concepts and catering options. The company was founded in 1983 and is based in New York, New York. And it doesn't trade on, or in Canada. No. So there you go. It actually, <laughs> although quite small, right, it trades, is it NASDAQ? It trades... Um, yep, NASDAQ. Yeah, mm-hmm. it trades on major exchange, even though it's pretty illiquid and everything. Current PE on a TTM basis, 13 times EBIT of sales, 0.6 times, 10-year median margins of EBIT, 4.7 times, uh, 10-year median returns, return on equity 10.1 times. Um, 10-year CAGR on revenue. Revenue has gone nowhere since 2011. Uh, it's actually a negative 1% CAGR. Uh, but gross margins have, uh, I would say, gone down, right? Well, maybe don't count 2020 because they're concentrated in New York City, but they've held pretty steady, I would say, from 2012 to 2019. Yeah, the business has completely changed in a few ways. So one, you have to take into account the dividends that they've paid. So if we go yeah. up and look at the stock, right, what's this stock? This is a $15 stock, and it's paid $9 or something in dividends in the last 10 years. So it's distributed most of the value that you have now. If it was just to go forward, it would be the same sort of yeah. thing. So that's why you have no growth. It distributes the cash, and these leases run out. Now, it has borrowed money and then bought things where it actually buys out the land. 10 years ago or so, that wasn't the strategy. Now it actually owns land under its restaurants in the South that it's been buying things. Um, it used to be big in Atlantic City. That all fell apart. It used to be big in a few other places in the Northeast and stuff, all the way from Washington, D.C. up to um, Boston. A lot of that's gone away. But Atlantic City is probably the big one. That there's a big decrease. Mm-hmm. The difficulty here is evaluating the company they have a partial ownership in Meadowlands. If it was developed in a casino, it'd be worth more. Their their interest would presumably be worth more than the market cap. So uh, the market cap on this company is like sixty million. I would guess that if that casino ever happened, if New Jersey voters voted to allow the Meadowlands project, even though there'd be dilution and everything, the way that their their part of the deal works as they're an investor in it is that their share would be worth the market would value it at well above the entire market cap of this company. And when will that deal? It was already voted down once before. Uh huh. So who knows? Mm-hmm. Will it ever happen? They seem to think happen? so. If you listen to the transcripts, they do. Yeah. I, there's New Jersey rules that once you vote something down, you have to wait a certain amount of time before putting it back on the ballot. Obviously, because of COVID and stuff, people would have thought that big deficits and stuff in the states, they'd be more likely to do it. New Jersey might be more likely to do it because um, previously they didn't want to do it because you'd be hurting Atlantic City. But as there's more competition from states around you and Atlantic City's already um, uh, declined so much, then there's less harm to that. Mm-hmm. The reason why they don't do it in New Jersey, the gambling is a large amount of lobbying from Atlantic City not to do it. 
right? Because Atlantic City is the original, like, you know, it's Las Vegas and Atlantic City. Yeah. It's that sort of mm-hmm. thing of having a place where you gamble that you didn't anywhere else and was once a big successful area. And the reason why is there wasn't gambling in all the states around it, but there was there. Um, the two things are one, if it ever gets approved, and two, at this point, you better approve it soon because there's been so much of all states opening up gambling that the value of the casino won't be as great sure. later, mm-hmm. you know? So having a casino right by um, New York City, you know, 10, 20 years ago would have been a gold mine at the rate that they're increasing gambling all around and the internet stuff and all of that, you know, gambling properties might be worth a lot less. But yeah, the lottery ticket here is worth more than the, the market cap, you sure. I was going to say, you kind of get that embedded call option. Mm-hmm. They're one of my favorite transcripts to, or earnings calls to listen to every single quarter. You have a very, yeah, feisty, very candid uh, CEO. It's, uh, yeah, it's candid, feisty. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's fun to listen to. I think to you it. have some private investors on it, right? So yeah. that's part mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the stock hasn't done well for 10 years or more, um, uh, though it's paid a dividend. And he made a point on a recent one w- uh, call, which I would agree with. Which someone was saying, should you sell the company or something? He said, I don't know how we would get a value, a fair valuation on that and mm-hmm. stuff. And I think that's true. I actually think that's a problem. Um, I know that uh, what was Landry's, uh, Tell me was Landry's yeah, yeah. had wanted to buy this company at twenty two dollars a share many years ago. Like what is it, um, six more more years ago? Um, but that is an issue they have now because like, what if management want to take it private? Well, I just said I think that the the Meadowlands value, even once you dilute it down and stuff. So what they have is they have a partial ownership in something that could be, they're like, what, the third largest shareholder or something in it? Mm -hmm. Less than 10% ownership in it. But in addition to that, they also have the concessions thing. The only limit on that is that Hard Rock gets to have a location. But otherwise, besides that, for like a Hard Rock Cafe or whatever, um, all the food and beverage would be them too. The combination of those two factors is presumably worth more than $60 million. You know, their equity stake, even after it gets diluted down, sort of like if you imagine like a venture capital thing, you know you're going to be diluted over time. But even counting that in, all those dilutions, it's still your stake is likely worth a lot. I believe you even said in that conference call that the EBITDA from all of that would be way more than the company's current EBITDA that they're generating. Yeah, I would assume so. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know enough about it, but it would have to... I mean, with the location and if it happened, but, you know, it's very speculative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was voted down. It's an idea to have a casino there. Um, yeah. But yes, I, I, I would say if it happened, if there was a 100% probability of it happening, then certainly that value alone would be worth the company's entire market cap. Mm-hmm. Now you could say, what if it's a 50-50 probability? Well, is their stake worth $120 million? You know, is it a one in three chance? Is their stake worth $180 million? You know, you have to kind of do the math on that. But you're also getting the existing restaurant business uh-huh. and some of that, you know, um, but, and you're also getting the capital allocation, which is what it is. Um, sometimes, you know, they've had problems because they leased a lot of their locations. Now they own a lot of those locations, but so they have a lot of debt. I mean, I don't know if this is really capturing all of what I would say the debt is. It's never really captured that with the lease stuff. It's very complicated because it makes it look like there's just been this huge change on their balance sheet. I would say there hasn't really been, what you've had is you swapped long-term leases for owning stuff, the property and the restaurant. Uh-huh, sure. Um, so someone who's knowledgeable about restaurant things could analyze each of the individual ones and get an idea of the properties they own. Cause it's not a chain. They own a bunch of different properties mm-hmm. in different places. And then they have this interest in the Meadowlands thing. It's like a mini conglomerate of a bunch of different restaurants. Yeah. I think the issue is that the people who would, uh, it mixes two things. We are talking about spinoffs and stuff. Like if you spun out that part of it, would it probably be valued at like more than um, ARC might be or something on its own? Yeah, because mm-hmm. you have two different kinds of investors. An investor who's going to buy into a $50 million market cap, you know, a micro cap, founder controlled basically, um, very consistent over time, uh, no growth restaurant business. And someone who wants to bet on a Meadowlands casino are two completely different people. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, we've talked about that before. I mean, this is sure, it's a $55 million market cap, but the amount of volume and revenue that goes through this business. And of course, it's just interesting the different multiples that are put on. Like, this isn't a small business at all. No. I no, mean, if you I ran mean, a private didn't. business and you said, well, well in normal years. They did $160 million in revenue. That's my point. If you yeah. ran a business like, oh, yeah, we do like $160 million in revenue. You'd be like, wow, that's a that's a lot of volume that runs through there. But 
you know, yeah, multiples you can on. look at the cash flow. Yeah, I mean, um, they'll do so. so a few years ago, they were doing 10 million in, in cash flow, you know, most of the time, on every average, year. yeah, yeah, 10 to 13 million. Um, they had some capex, but that's changed a little bit, so that's very hard to evaluate. I'd say that's mostly. I wouldn't call it growth. I would say that they replaced leases by buying things, but I don't expect that to continue forever now that they own those things. So like there you see that 14 million, you know, I don't, you're not going to see that every year. So if you use cash flow from operations instead of like EBITDA or something like that, um, you can see that it was double digit millions from 2012 to 2019. Obviously 2020 shouldn't count. Um, so it was all, you know, they had an 8 million year there and a 9 million, but basically it's 10 million or more. Um, and then if you look, we just said the company's market cap is uh, 60 million or something. So it's less than six times cash flow. Um, there's the issues of, like we said, leases versus debt versus all of that. So you might not say that it's free cash flow that way. But I mean, like if you sold off each little individual restaurant, do restaurants and transactions go for less than that? Yeah, they probably go for lower multiples. Restaurant chains certainly go for higher multiples. Um, and then you have the added, uh, you have the added, um, Meadowlands thing. Mm -hmm. My guess with the stock's actual performance is just that it'll depend on the dividend. I mean, historically that's what people did. Mm -hmm. So if they reinstate the dividend at a dollar or something, then you'll see the stock rise to $25 or something because people, you know, if that's the interest rate environment, we'll start valuing it at 4% yield. They won't let it trade at a seven or 8% yield. If it seems like a consistent company, it'll just start, you know, when people look for dividend yield, when they see a yield of seven or eight percent or something, mm -hmm. they look to see if something's wrong with the company. If it's not, they keep buying it to the point where it gets down to like a four percent mm -hmm. yield or something. Those people who are who are really into high dividend yield stocks. So I kind of think that's more likely to what will happen with this company. You know, which doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Like we, I mean, it shouldn't be determined by what the dividend payout is. Mm -hmm. You know, like we said, there's the casino thing, and there's what's the actual cash flow and everything of the business. Yeah, it's pretty. You know, five times. Yeah, so like you can, you can see that their free cash flow um, margin on average has been over 4%. Um, and then, you know, price to sales, you can see what last year's sales were. Now they're going to lose some of that permanently um, because there'll be some stuff that closes that doesn't come back from COVID basically because they have stuff that comes off lease and everything. But uh, you can imagine that with the way that was that, you know, you have, um, you're trading at 10 times free cash flow or something. And then you have this metal lands thing, but I just think it will probably trade off of the, um, the dividend, mm -hmm. which, you know, so maybe people could buy it ahead of that if they think it's gonna come back or whatever. Companies usually pretty conservative though. So they might be slower to put back in a dividend than others. Yeah, would people are already asking them to do that on their earnings calls and stuff. And he yeah. didn't seem like it was something that was going to be in the near term. That's usually people ask, right? Mm -hmm. Sell the company, pay me a dividend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think those have a lot to do with what the long-term value of the company is. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that it would make sense to why sell the company now anyway. And I think it'd be really controversial because imagine you sell the company and you know, I'm yeah, like, what if he participates? Yeah, I was gonna say, what if they did like a management buyout? Then people are like, well, you knew you had this this call option, this potentially uh, worth more than the entire market cap now. Yeah, it, I mean, he would know more about the chances, yeah. I guess, in New, in New Jersey than I would. I mean, and the way he communicates on the calls is that they clearly they're pretty. They think it's going to go through. Not like that means anything, <laughs> but yeah. Presumably, you're saying that he would know uh, more than the average If you put the, the company up for auction or something, would someone possibly, would one of these other companies that are into gaming and um, and food and all that want to buy it? Yeah, they, they might just for that. Um, I don't know. I mean, if it was really just sell it to any bidder, someone might buy it to own that and, and, not, and sell this part back. You know what I mean? Um, I think any deal would be like really messy and ugly and whatever, but things happen. I mean, Cambria eventually closed on that deal. Yikes. <laughs> um, yeah. They kept raising we the price. We should do an entire but... podcast was dedicated to that. <laughs> um, Hunter Douglas tried mm -hmm. and it didn't work out, but then the stock went up a lot higher than that. But they've tried three or four times to, mm -hmm. to squeeze people out on that one. So, and the funniest thing is, is you've always said your biggest word with Hunter Douglas was a take under. Oh, it's very clear whether they were yeah. doing it. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it didn't work. Mm -hmm. so i mean they moved to another country like they issued the preferred stock they did everything to try to do that and still 
didn't pull it off that time. Now they'll they'll do it eventually. Mm-hmm. You know, like every time the stock has collapsed, like three or four times, they bought up more of it and tried all these different things. But you can see why just buying really cheap assets does work. Cheap versus what like a private owner would pay for mm-hmm. it is in each of those cases, like we talked about, where people said, "Oh, they're you know management's going to screw me in this company." Each time they had to pay up a little bit for. It. I mean, Cambria didn't close it at the original price that they wanted for it, mm-hmm. and they just made it. Um, after, you know, doing the offer and for a long time and, you know, it took a lot of work. Um, Hunter Douglas didn't work at all. A lot of companies, you know, when management tries to buy out a company on the cheap in the U S but also in some other countries, um, you do normally get like a higher bid than you were hoping than you were, um, expecting, you know, I found that true in Japan. I mean, yeah, I always got net nets. I always got taken out of what I thought was an unfair price, but it was way higher than the stock price had been. Mm-hmm. So just buying on the basis that you think a private owner would pay more. I don't know if that's the case here because I don't know enough about gambling and stuff. But if someone had a better idea of what the odds were of that Meadowlands Casino, then they'd be able to value what this would be. This is the kind of thing you expect like a Gabelli or something to own. It's I was too small. Reminds you of yeah, him. Yep. yeah, definitely. That's the kind of thing I would think of. What type of research then would you do to try figuring that out? Hmm. I mean, you can do scuttlebutt on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't need to do scuttlebutt it just on the chances of that it might happen or not. I don't think you need to do any scuttlebutt on what the value of it would be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just know it's huge. Yeah. I mean, versus what it's being valued at. I mean, Correct. we just yeah, said. today in the market, yeah. This is a company that, yeah, it, it's, we, I mean, honestly, I would say it's valued at nothing in the stock market. Mm-hmm. I mean, this the stock trades at what it would trade at if there was no Meadowlands thing, mm-hmm. I think. I mean, yeah, I don't think the Meadowlands thing is what's keeping the valuation here. It had a... It was paying a dollar in dividends until uh, COVID and trades at $15, 15 times dividends. The, you, what your historical dividend was, that's not expensive at all. That's uh-huh. over a 6%. You're getting to 6 to 7% yield mm-hmm. on what it was before. So certainly the market doesn't give any value to Meadowlands because Meadowlands is like break even their interest in it. In fact, I don't believe they've received distributions from it. They might start because um, it has a sports book there. So because it's a, what do you call it? What am I trying to think of? Um Anyway, it's the ones where the they're... Wagons? In the wagons? Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. wagons. What's so, that called? So that's what the yeah. track really is is for mm-hmm. um, now. So I think that they just do sports betting there and they want to have a casino. Um, yeah. So I, I think it has no value on it. That this, The stock doesn't give any value to the idea of the Meadowlands thing. They've been open by the fact that it's there. It's not like it's just hidden in the filings or something. So mm-hmm. I don't know why... Yeah, they're, they're pretty open about it and talk about it. Yeah, but it, you know... it. We don't know if it'll ever happen. If it does, we don't know when it'll happen. Um, it's the kind of thing that people, you know, might not pay a lot for. And then, like I said, also the paying the dividend stuff, you attract exactly the opposite crowd. Mm-hmm. No one wants like a dividend and a lottery ticket. Mm-hmm. You know, those are two completely different kinds of investors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Interesting. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you're tuning in, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Follow me on Twitter. Go to focuscompounding.com to get access to write-ups uh, that Jeff writes up on the website. Um, and of course, if you want to sign up for QuickFS, go to quickfs.net and tell them that you came from Focus Compounding. It helps support everything that we do on the podcast. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us. We will see you next week. Take care.